I'm Jeff Grow, and this is your final exam review for Calculus 1. We begin with question 1. State the definition of the derivative. You're going to use this definition again in Calculus 2 and Calculus 3, so you may as well just memorize it now. After all, the one distinguishing characteristic of mathematics is that words actually mean things. f prime of x is the limit. As h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Easy as that. You know the first question on the exam. You know the first answer. Question 2. State the definition of the definite integral. Now, there are different ways of stating this definition. I just want you to give the following. The integral from a to b of f of x dx is, by definition, the limit as the norm on the nth partition goes to 0 of the sum as k goes from 1 to n, f of ck delta xk. Next question. Evaluate the integral from 0 to 1 x squared dx using the definition. In particular, you will have no credit for using the fundamental theorem of calculus. You must use the definition of the definite integral. Why do I need a problem like this when I've already asked you to state the definition? As you know by now, knowing something conceptually is different from knowing something functionally. Delta x is b minus a over n, and on this problem, that's 1 minus 0 over n, or 1 over n. The partition points are a plus k delta x, where a in this case is 0. So we get k over n. The integral then, if we call this i for integral, is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum as k goes from 1 to n of the xk's squared, that's k over n squared, times the delta x, which is 1 over n. This gives you the limit as n goes to infinity. We'll have a 1 over n cubed that can be factored out of the sum. And inside of the sum, the only thing that's left is k squared. That gives us the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n cubed, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, over 6. And the answer is going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients, since we have a cubic divided by a cubic, and that will be 2 divided by 6, or 1 third. On this last problem, you don't know the nature of the problem that I'll give you on the actual final exam, so I want you to memorize these three formulas. The sum as k goes from 1 to n of k is n times n plus 1 over 2. The sum, as k goes from 1 to n of k squared, is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. And the sum, as k goes from 1 to n of k cubed, is the quantity n times n plus 1 over 2 quantity squared. Next, we have a sequence of derivatives you need to calculate. We'll start simply and work our way through. First, y equals x to the one-third plus one over x squared. Before calculating the derivative, it might be best if you rewrite this as x to the one-third plus x to the negative two shove this across the division symbol, and therefore change the sign. 
The derivative is then one third x to the negative two thirds minus two x to the negative three. Don't try to simplify any of these. Just put a box around it and leave it. On the next problem, we're given f of x equals 4x cubed minus 7x plus 1 times the quantity squared plus 4x minus 2. Please don't foil this out. Just use the product rule. f prime of x is 12x minus 7 times 3x squared plus 4x minus 2 plus 4x cubed minus 7x plus 1 times 6x plus 4. Box it. It's done. Please don't simplify these answers. Next, y equals x squared plus 3 over x squared minus 4. This one, an obvious application of the quotient rule. Derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom divided by the bottom squared. Box it. It's done. On the next problem, we have 3x squared plus x to the power 12. Here, you're being tested over the chain rule. f prime of x is, bring the power down, leave the inside alone, subtract 1 from the exponent, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Don't simplify, box it, it's done. Next, we have y equals pi squared. This is obviously a trick question. The derivative is 0 because pi squared is constant. On the next problem, we have f of x is the square root of 2x minus cosine squared of 6x. You may, of course, begin by re-expressing this as 2x minus cosine squared of 6x to the power of 1 half, but this step is technically not necessary because you know that the derivative of the square root of x is 1 over 2 root x. We have then f prime of x equals 1 half leave the inside alone, subtract 1 from the exponent, times the derivative of the inside. The first term has a derivative of 2. In calculating the derivative of the next term, bring the 2 down, leave the inside alone, and then multiply by the derivative of the cosine 6x. That's negative sine of 6x, and then times 6. The next problem is an implicit differentiation problem. We begin with xy minus 4 x cubed y squared plus 7 equals 0. On the first term, we apply the product rule. That's 2xy plus x squared y prime. On the second, we apply the product rule again. This is a prime. We have minus 12 x squared y squared minus 8 x cubed y y prime. The derivative of 7 is, of course, 0, and the derivative of 0 is 0. Next, we solve for y prime, so we ship the terms that don't have a y prime to the other side, and factor a y prime out of what is left over. We have y prime times the quantity x squared minus 8 
x cubed y equals 12 x squared y squared minus 2 x y. We complete the problem by dividing the coefficient of y prime off and solving for y prime. That's 12 x squared y squared minus 2 x y divided by x squared minus 8 x cubed y. Now that you've demonstrated some basic differentiation skills, you also need to demonstrate some basic integration skills. We'll begin with the integral of 6 x squared minus 4x plus 4 dx. Here we apply the power rule for antiderivatives. This gives us 6x cubed over 3 minus 4x squared over 2 plus 4x plus c. On indefinite integrals, don't forget to add c. You don't need to simplify this. Put a box around it. It's done. Next, we have the integral from 1 to 2, x squared dx. Here, I'm expecting you to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll find an antiderivative using the power rule for antiderivatives. Evaluate the endpoints and obtain our answer. On the next problem, we're integrating secant x tangent x dx. And the answer is, of course, secant x plus c. But we may as well review the various integrals involving the trig functions, just so that you'll know them. You don't know which one I'm going to put on the exam, so you may as well write all of these down. The integral of sine is negative cosine x plus c. The integral of cosine of x dx is positive sine x plus c. The integral of, let's see, secant squared x dx is tan x plus c. The integral of cosecant squared x dx is minus cotan x plus c. The integral of secant tan we already have, so let's just go to cosecant x. Cotangent x is minus cosecant x plus c. The integral of cosecant squared is the next one on the practice, since we've already done that one. Let's go to the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine x dx. Now, I'll be terribly disappointed if you don't just write 1. We already know that this is half a bump on the cosine curve. And half a bump gives you 1. One bump gives you 2. Yes, you may solve this using the fundamental theorem of calculus, but that's overkill. Our next problem is a related rate problem. An oil spill is expanding across the floor in a circular disk. Oil is being added at a rate of 3 cubic centimeters per minute. The disk has a thickness of 0 0.2 centimeters. How fast is the radius of the disk increasing? When the radius is 10 centimeters. 
This is a related rate problem. Here we have a volumetric rate of change. So the answer must have something to do with volume. The volume of a cylindrical disk like this is pi r squared h. In this case, h is a constant 0 0.2. Both r and v are functions of time. So we can calculate their derivatives with respect to time. The derivative is going to be 2 pi r dr dt times the 0 0.2. Now, it's at this point that we make our substitutions, not until after you've calculated the derivative. The volumetric rate of change, dv dt, is 3 cubic centimeters per minute. The radius is 10 centimeters. We can now solve for dr dt. First of all, let's simplify this a little bit. 10 times 0.2 is 2, times 2 is 4. It follows then that dr dt is 3 over 4 pi. The next problem is the famous rocket problem. I state that a model rocket is launched straight up using a C67 engine. Obviously, that's a red herring. Ignore that. You stand 500 feet away and observe that when the rocket reaches its maximum height altitude, it makes an angle of 65 degrees with the ground. A Calculate how high the rocket went. Define your variable. h divided by 500 is opposite over adjacent. That's tangent. So h is 500 times the tangent of 65 degrees. No calculator. Box it and leave it. Drop the calculations at the point that you would need a calculator. You will not have a calculator on the exam. Part B. If you can only measure the angle to within plus or minus 3 degrees, what is the maximum percent error for your height calculation? Maximum percent error. That's 100% times the relative error. First of all, we're going to write this as h equals 500 times the tangent of theta. It follows from this that dh is 500 times the secant squared of theta d theta. The relative error divides by h on both sides. The percent error then is no bigger than what you get when you plug in the largest value for the error in theta. So we're going to have secant squared of 65 degrees over the tangent of 65 degrees times 3, but it must be converted to radians. So it's going to be 3 pi over 180. So the degrees go away. This is the answer to part B. The next problem asks us to prove the equation 3x cubed plus x plus 7 equals 0 has exactly one solution in the closed and bounded interval negative 2, 1. Remember that these problems have two steps. First, you need to prove the existence of a solution. And second, you need to prove that there's only one uniqueness.
The existence part of the proof requires the use of the intermediate value theorem. So we need to check that the hypotheses of the intermediate value theorem are satisfied. One of the hypotheses is that the function in question must be continuous. So we'll set f of x to be 3x cubed plus x plus 7. And note that f is continuous everywhere since it is a polynomial. Now, f of 0 is 7, which is positive, and at negative 2, we'll have negative 2 cubed is negative 8, times 3 is negative 24, plus negative 2 is negative 26, plus 7 is negative 19, which is negative. So that 0 is an intermediate value between negative 19 and 7. So by the intermediate value theorem, there exists some point C between negative 2 and 0 such that f of c equals 0. So we have the existence part down. Next is the uniqueness part. This is a reductio ad absurdum proof using Rolle's theorem. So we'll suppose There are two solutions, C1 and C2. Here, f of C1 equals f of C2 equals 0. And C1 and C2 are supposed to be within our interval, negative 2 to 1. Wolf's theorem requires that the function be differentiable. Note that f is differentiable because it is a polynomial. By Rolle's theorem, there has to be some place in between these roots assuming that between negative 2 and 0, you have C1 and C2, there has to be some place in between those roots where the derivative is 0. Uh, such that f prime of c is 0. Now, Here's where the contradiction comes in. F prime is 9x squared plus 1, and that's always bigger than 0, which means it can never be 0. What's wrong? What's wrong is the existence of two solutions. Therefore, there is at most one. And that is the end of the proof. Next, we have a large number of limits. We'll begin with the limit as x goes to minus infinity of, of 5x minus 1 over 4x squared plus 3x plus 5. Obviously, Going to minus infinity is a bit of a ruse. We have a higher degree in the denominator than in the numerator, so the limit will be zero. 
The next problem is the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x squared. This is a L'Hopital's rule case, 0 over 0. And so we take the derivative and take the limit again. The derivative of, on the top is a sine x. The derivative on the bottom is 2x. And that is 1 half. We already know that sine x over x goes to 1 as x goes to 0. Or you may apply L'Hopital's rule a second time if you wish. We have the limit as x goes to infinity of 6x squared plus 3x plus 1 over 3x squared minus x minus 2. Since the degrees are the same, we take the ratio of the leading coefficients, and the answer is 2. We have then the limit as x goes to 3 of x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. You may consider this to be a L'Hopital's rule case. Or you could factor, which is the way that we handled these earlier in the course. Either way, the answer is 6. The next problem is the limit as x goes to infinity of 4x squared plus 1 over 5x minus 5. The degree on top is higher. The whole thing goes to infinity. In the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of 1 over x minus 1, if you're plugging in numbers that are just a wee bit bigger than 1, you get positive denominators, but that are tiny. And 1 over tiny is huge. This thing goes to plus infinity. If we had gone to 1 from the left instead, it would be a little bit smaller than 1. The denominators would be negative and tiny. We would go to negative infinity instead. Next up is the limit as x goes to infinity of 2 minus 2x over the square root of 7 plus 4x squared. x is going to infinity, which means that we look for the highest degree terms in top and bottom. If we ignore the 7 when x gets big, the second term in the under the radical dominates, so you can ignore that. You get 4 times um, x squared under the radical. That's going to be 2 times the absolute value of x. If x is going to positive infinity, the bottom will go to positive infinity at the rate of 2x. The top goes to negative infinity, but at a similar rate. So the answer is... If you have 2x over 2x, as x goes to positive infinity, the answer will be minus 1. Next up, we have the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 minus cosine x over sine squared x. This is a L'Hopital's rule case, so we'll have the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over 2 sine x cosine x. The sine x will cancel and the limit will be 1 half. The next problem is the limit as x goes to 0 from the right of pi. Pi is a constant. doesn't matter where you go or for which side. The limit will be pi. Next up is the limit as x goes to 0 of sine squared x over x squared. We know that if we take the limit of sine x over x, we get 1. 
So the answer is 1 squared, or just 1. On the next problem, we're taking the limit as x goes to 0 from the left, x to the fourth, plus 12x cubed, minus 17x plus 2. Going from the left is a bit of a ruse. Polynomials are continuous, so the left and right limits are always equal. All you have to do is plug in 0, and the answer is 2. Next, we have the limit as x goes to uh, infinity, positive infinity, of negative 2x. The answer is clearly minus infinity. Next up, we have the limit as x goes to 0 from the left, absolute value of x over x. You might remember the graph of this function. It's 1 to the right of 0 and negative 1 to the left of 0. So that if you approach 0 from the left, you get negative 1. And now for our last limit, we have the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 over h, the integral from 3 to 3 plus h, cosine of t squared dt. On this problem, you need to use the mean value theorem for definite integrals. To rewrite this as the limit as h goes to 0 of the cosine of c squared. The mean value theorem for definite integral states that a continuous function attains its average on a closed and bounded interval. C is between 3 and 3 plus h, and that tells us how to calculate the limit. If C is trapped between 3 and 3 plus h, and h is going to 0, then C gets squished to 3. The answer is the cosine of 9. Next on the lineup is a graphing problem. We have 2x minus 1, x minus 3, over x times x minus 2. You're asked to only do two steps of our four-step paradigm, find the intercepts and asymptotes. So for the intercepts, the x-intercepts occur where y is 0. If you set a fraction equal to 0, only the numerator is 0, so we get 1 half and 3. So on our graph, at 1, 2, 3, curve will go through the axis, and it will also go through at 1 half. The y-intercept occurs when you set x equal to 0. If x is equal to 0, you have negative 1 times negative 3 is 3. Oh, but we have a problem at 0. We get division by 0. So there are none. So we look for vertical asymptotes next. Those are roots of the denominator. Yes, at 0, which we just discovered, and also at 2. In this case, since the degree of the polynomial in the numerator is the same as the degree of the polynomial in the denominator, the horizontal asymptote will be the limit as x goes to infinity, and that will be the ratio of the leading coefficients, y equals 2. At this point, we should be able to figure out what the graph is using the principle that a graph must be asymptotic to its asymptote. On the right, it either does this or this, but since it goes through the x-axis at 3, 
it must go something like this. If you miss, just make the curve bigger. On the far left, it either goes up or down. Since it can't go down, because it would have to cross the axis, it must go up. Finally, uh, we could use the principle that all of these powers are 1. So it has to go on the opposite sides. If it goes up on one side of an asymptote, it goes down on the other. We have, finally, the graph. The next problem is to determine the intervals where the given function is increasing and where it is decreasing. The function is 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 12x plus 1. Intervals of increasing and decreasing are determined by the first derivative, so we'll calculate the derivative. After all, you are a derivative calculating machine. That gives us 6x squared plus 6x minus 12. We'll factor a 6 out and then factor the remaining quadratic. We have 6 times the quantity x plus 2, x minus 1, they're opposites and signs, and the bigger one must be positive. Setting that equal to 0, we get the critical points, negative 2 and 1. Drawing a number line, making sure not to draw too many hash marks. If we plug in negative 3, we'll have negative times negative hits positive. Plugging in 0, we get positive times negative. We get a negative and then a positive out there. So we have this function is increasing from negative infinity to negative 2 and from 1 to infinity. And it is decreasing from negative 2 to 1. On the next problem, we are to determine the intervals on which the function is concave up and concave down, and also find any x-coordinates of any inflection points. The function is x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus 36x squared minus 12x plus 1. We're looking for intervals of concavity. So let's start calculating derivatives. We'll have 4x cubed plus 6x squared minus 72x minus 12. Concavity is determined by the second order derivative, so we have to calculate another derivative. 12x squared plus 12x minus 72. 72 is divisible by 12. 6 times 12 is 72, so we'll factor a 12 out. And then factor the quadratic. 3 and 2, opposite signs, the bigger one wins. So, setting this equal to 0, we have the x-coordinates of any possible points at negative 3 and 2. To determine intervals of concavity, we'll plot these on the number line and plot one point within each of the resulting three intervals. At negative 4, we'll have negative, negative, that's positive. At 0, it's positive, negative, that's negative. And at, say, 3, we have positive, positive, everyone's positive. It's concave up. From minus infinity to minus 3. You may or may not opt to include these endpoints. I'll not care. And then from 2 to infinity, it's concave down. From negative 3 to 2, 
and we get a change in concavity of each of these, so we have inflection points at x equals negative 3 and 2. You'll be delighted to learn that we are at the last problem in the final exam review. On this problem, we find and classify the critical points of the function f of x equals x to the fourth minus 6x squared plus 8x, and we're told that x equals 1 is a zero of the derivative. That's like saying one of the critical points is x equals 1. So I'm helping you out here. We'll calculate the derivative, set it equal to 0, and solve for x. So we have 4x cubed minus 12x plus 8. We can factor a 4 out of all of these. So we'll have x cubed minus 3x plus 2. The problem being that we have a cube right here. This cube is a serious problem. If this were merely a quadratic, we would factor it in the normal way. Being a cubic, it's going to take a little more work. So we'll use synthetic division. The coefficients are 1, 0, negative 3, and 2. And you are given that 1 is a root. So we'll bring 1 down, multiply, and add. Multiply and add. Multiply and add. As predicted, you get 0. That tells us that the polynomial factors as x minus 1, since 1 is a root, x minus 1 must be a factor. And what's left over is x squared plus x minus 2. This will factor now x, x, 2, and 1. The 2 gets the plus, because we have a plus in the middle. So the critical points are x equals 1 and negative 2. x equals 1 is a root of multiplicity 2. To classify the critical points, we'll use the first derivative test. So we'll plot the critical points on the number line keeping in mind that x minus 1 is squared as a factor. So this factor will always be non-negative. If we plot negative 3, we'll get a negative times a positive. That's negative. Plotting 0, we get a positive times a positive. And plotting something like 2 positive positive. Aha! So x equals negative 2 is a local min. f has a local min at x equals minus 2. And that's it.